Come back, Andy. All is forgiven. Uh, so past the my, it's just after midday on Friday. Jehania, the 19th of January. And this is the Max Radio's Man and Line. And it's me, Phil Dawn, looking after things while Andy recovers. Home Affairs Minister and Deputy Chief Minister Jane Poole Wilson topped the poll at the middle election. An outspoken former MHK... Um, uh, former... Outspoken former Manx Radio shock jock, I should have, should have said, managed a creditable second place. Both are relatively quiet in Tinwald, so now is our chance to find out a bit more about their political progress. This is your programme, so please call and ask them tough questions. So, um, I suppose to start with, uh, Jane Poole Wilson and Stu Peters, what, um, what is the... Uh, What's it like being at MHK? You're two and a half years in now. Are you? Uh, w- is it what you expect? To start with you, Stu, because you you had the other end of the microphone for for many years. Uh, is it is it what you expected? Um, well, it, it's very different, I have to say, Phil, and uh, it feels very strange to be in here on this side of the uh, microphone. <laughs> I think the last time that you and I were doing this, it was uh, roles reverse, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, and that was more fun. <laughs> but there, there we are. Um, and Jane, I mean, you you did have some experience in Tinwald as an MLC, but uh, it's quite a a diff- well, I don't know. You tell me. Is it a different role? It is absolutely a different role. Uh, you know, I went for LegCo and I enjoyed my time there because of my what I thought would be my contribution to the scrutiny of legislation. And uh, that was a, a very strong focus for me when I was in Legislative Council. Of course, you come into uh, Keys, you obviously have your constituency responsibilities. And I was... Uh, willing to take on the responsibility of taking on a, a ministership, even though it was my first time in Keys. Um, and that's obviously a steep learning curve in and of itself. I greatly enjoy the Home Affairs Brief, I have to say, but there's um, there's no question that it's, it's yeah, it's, it's challenging, it's demanding, but um, endlessly interesting and, and, you know, a good opportunity to make a contribution in a different way, I think. And Deputy Chief Minister as well. Uh, what does that entail? Yes. So, I mean, I think um, it it was the idea that obviously things can happen uh, and uh, rather than just uh, have potentially a vacuum, if for some reason the chief minister isn't on Ireland, has to be off Ireland for business or uh, that there are other things that need to be tackled to have somebody designated in in that role. Uh, so for me, it, it's it's generally about deputising uh, for the chief minister. I think I have been very conscious of wanting to be on top of my brief as, as Home Affairs Minister. So I've taken some real time over the last couple of years to really try and understand the department, the challenges and the work programme that we're trying to deliver. Um, I suppose uh, I'm also conscious that uh, as an island and as a council of ministers, I can increase my contribution in that sense to a more pan pan government engagement, if you like. Well, it is your programme, listeners. Um, please do get in touch if you've got a question for the uh, MHKs, or indeed if there's anything else on your mind this dinner time. Sixty six thirteen sixty eight is the number to call. You can also text one six six one seven seven or email studio at manxradio.com and we have two callers on the line uh, I think David Quirk was, was first of those so hopefully I'll work out how to I'm, I'm clicking away madly here ah here we go David ah uh, here we go there we are there, Phil? <laughs> we'll get there in the end uh, David David Quirk uh, Onken Commissioner I'm two guests yeah but I'm talking as a civilian now right, okay. as a, a taxpayer yep. only the minor taxpayer now and a, a citizen of the Isle of Man some time ago I asked the minister who was on Manx Radio regarding support to the chief constable of the Isle of Man because he's got a living uh, staff and resources and I did say uh, at the time regarding number plate recognition CCTV at the sea terminal and the airport and face recognition and I'm just wondering what the minister, there's two questions to it, what the minister is doing now towards the budget. Has she, her, has she or her department provided any funds to help the chief constable out for the future? And the other one was, and I'll leave you then, Phil, is regarding the vaping bill to protect young children on the Isle of Man who are vaping in schools. Nobody's doing to do nothing about it. Where are we at it? You could do a bill within a day. 
but you can't protect children of the Isle of Man. What's your excuse? So, Minister, uh, two questions from uh, David. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, Nice to speak to you again. Um, On the first issue, yes, you're absolutely right. There is um, work underway, which which actually I think when I was previously on the Man in Line, we were talking about port security, which is an area of priority that has definitely moved up the 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 agenda um and there there are different things actually david when it comes to the the different types of technology you're talking about so part of it is funding uh, some of it actually is um uh, also agreements to access so when it comes to ampr um, we are in a position where we should be able to move forward with that relatively smoothly. Facial recognition is slightly more complex because also we have to uh, look at some legislative aspects around that. But for sure, it's on the agenda. It's something that we're pursuing along with various other work streams around port security and so on. So we will be making progress with that. Uh, I think on your second point on the vaping products bill, that completed its passage uh, through the Keys and Legislative Council just before for Christmas. So it will have gone off to seek royal assent. I hope we get that royal assent as soon as we can and then we can start to um, implement that legislation. Yeah, if I could just, yeah, you're saying we're doing this and we're doing that. When are we going to do it as, is the answer. And Stu Peters is not getting away with it. <laughs> Regarding his involvement in the DOI, sometime come and have a look at their bus shelter in Governor's Road. I know I emailed the department they're, um, as far as I'm concerned, useless. It's an absolute stinking hole of a shelter, right? And nobody seems to want to do something. And before you say it's a local authority issue, it isn't. So and I'll leave you with that. So if we built a Rolls-Royce bus shelter there, would it still be a stinking hole is the question? Nobody's looking... Uh, the, the other issue is, and it's come from government as well, we're not ma- maintaining what we've got. We have a stock of X, Y and Z, Right. Shouldn't we be at least going round once a year making sure things are are good or happy? Well, in DOI, we do have people doing that all the time, um, constantly looking at what we've got uh, and seeing whether or not it needs maintenance. If it does need maintenance or repair, then it goes on a list because, you know, you'll appreciate that there's only so much money to go around. Um, So it goes on a list and it's prioritised that way. But one... I'm sorry, uh, Stu, uh, but anyway... When I uh, email into the department as a civilian and say, look, it's been drawn to my attention about this shelter, send yeah. photographs in, growing with ivy, uh, graffiti on the inside, which is of a male nature, and uh, water pouring in, and the latest one, the water all frozen, and somebody nearly hurt themselves. Isn't that a risk? Uh, water, water pouring in, yes. Graffiti is more a societal problem, isn't it? Yeah. Well, maybe we should talk to the Minister for Home Affairs. See ya. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, so we do have Julian, and hopefully I'll manage to work at this time. Yes, there we are, Julian. <laughs> are you Hi, there? Phil. Sorry for keeping Hi. you hanging on for a, a, a few minutes there, but uh, you have some questions. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, uh, specifically for Jane, please. Um, the Republic of Ireland has a new hate speech bill going through uh, Doyle Aaron, the Irish Assembly. It's called the Criminal Justice Incitement to Violence or Hatred and Hate Offences Bill of 2022. Um, Many academics and lawmakers around the world are worried about the restrictive and tyrannical nature of this new hate speech bill. For example, Section 2 presumes guilt until innocence can be proven. Um, A lower court and one policeman can initiate a property search and uh, mere possession of documents, cartoons or memes on a device like a phone or a laptop can result in prosecution because of the intent to share such things. Some would call this a thought crime. Uh, refusal to give login passwords or PIN numbers will be an automatic crime. Uh, the definition of hatred within the Act only states hatred towards protected classes, but doesn't define exactly what hate or hatred is. Therefore, it's difficult to know what the threshold for prosecution is. Um, this proposed Irish hate speech bill is now being fast-tracked through Doyle Aaron following riots in Dublin after Riyad Bouchaka, a homeless 50-year-old Algerian, attempted to murder three infants and a school teacher outside a primary school with a 36-centimetre kitchen knife. I think the five-year-old little girl was critically ill and is still in hospital since November. 
Um, my questions for you, um, Jane, are, are there any elements of the proposed Irish hate speech legislation included in your proposed um, Isle of Man hate speech bill? Um, how much verifiable hate is there on the Isle of Man to require such laws? Um, and I don't know about your opinion, but isn't the proposed Irish hate speech bill protecting the criminals rather than the victims? Jane? Thanks. Hello, Julian. Um I'm I'm sorry I I haven't actually read the text of of the Irish bill so it's it's difficult for me to comment on on exactly what what's in it. I mean I've I've listened to what you've just described but it's it's not something I can comment on not having having read it myself. I think the um focus in the Isle of Man and I think we have to remember we absolutely legislate for ourselves and any legislation that we bring forward would go out to consultation in any event so I think that's really really important to note. And I think you're absolutely right that um if we are legislating, we are legislating to address challenges and, and issues that we face as an island. So it's not particularly relevant as to perhaps what another jurisdiction perceives to be challenges that it needs to legislate for. I think two things have come up that I'm very aware of that um, uh, it is worth us considering tackling in the Isle of Man. One is the abuse that's um sadly increasingly the experience of our frontline emergency workers so in our recent road shows uh, with the constabulary around the Isle of Man that issue did crop up actually that it, it is a concern sadly that we do now see people um, in some instances actually assaulting but also an increased level of, of abuse towards people performing their duties so I do think that is something that allowing for aggravated sentencing powers for a court in those situations is absolutely important and I think would make a difference to our frontline emergency service workers. I think in the context of um, hate crime, I think the issue there, and it is sadly something that has cropped up in the Isle of Man, although I can't give you actual um raw numbers off the top of my head, Julian. Sadly, we have had incidences, particularly um, related to homophobia, but not just that, actually related to people's um, religious and and racial um, origin, where people have uh, given abuse to other people uh, verbally, but sadly, we have had assault cases. And in my view, uh, that sort of assault is unacceptable in any event and is already against the law. But I think if the assault or the the uh, the treatment is motivated clearly and there is clear evidence by a protected characteristic such as somebody's sexual orientation or their religious or uh, religious beliefs or race then again I would be in favour of, of a court having the power to provide enhanced aggravating sentences in an appropriate case which would be within the court's power to to look at based on all the evidence. Happy with that Julian? Hello. We've already got um, the Harassment Act, haven't we? Um, is it not more to do with perhaps the lack of policing and catching these people more than just putting on more and more regulations on top of it? And and who is going to decide what the hate is in that hate speech? I mean, who who will be deciding um, who who is going to administer the hate speech itself? So I, th- I think there's two things there, Julian, because I think they're very good points that you raise. I think... We, it's our obligation as legislators to make sure that when we draft and bring forward legislation, we try and put sufficient um, parameters of definition around that. So, for example, under our Equality Act, we already have a definition of protected characteristics. So one way in which we could approach it is to uh, is to determine it via that. And I mentioned um, aggravated sentencing powers when it comes to assaulting um, emergency workers. Well, there is roughly equivalent legislation already in the UK. So there are models of legislation that we can look at to try and make sure we put adequate definition around it. Then, of course, in any individual case, it will always be a matter of what the evidence is. And so that then becomes a matter for investigation and prosecution and defence to determine what exactly happened. And I think um, on your point about uh, the importance of these laws, actually, there is benefit in highlighting to society that society takes a view that certain behaviours are absolutely not acceptable and there can be enhanced consequences. And one of the things that we found out um, when I was involved with Pride and we did what I have to say was an informal survey, but one of the things we found out was some people are unwilling to report things to the police because they don't perceive there to be any protection in place for their specific concerns. And so they actually end up thinking there's no point 
in reporting what's happened to them because they don't believe there are any powers under the existing law to address them. Stu, have, have you got views on, on hate uh, speech and the like? Yeah, I think we've got to be very careful, as Julian said, that this isn't the thin end of the wedge and that we don't end up in this dystopian Orwellian future where what you think might land you in clink. Um, because, you know, that's that's a nightmare. I think it's all very woke. I think that uh, that Jane made some good points about that, you know, there are some benefits, and certainly in terms of emergency workers, uh, there need to be whatever protections we can put in there. Um, but, you know, who decides which are the, the sort of the, the protected uh, classes of people? So uh, I'm old, uh, I'm fat, I'm a come-over, so would it be illegal to call people come-overs, uh, for example, under this kind of thing? Well, can I come interject yeah. there? Stu, you would be involved, because you are a legislator now, so you would be involved in drafting any legislation and, and considering it, and so would the public, because as I say, any legislation that we bring forward would go out to public consultation. Well, uh, we've got so many... Uh texts into the programme, questions, another caller I see flashing up on the screen. So um, we'll quickly take a break and then come back to uh, the MHKs shortly. So we're back and uh, as I, as those of you who have been listening to the whole programme will know, we have uh, Jane Poole Wilson and um, Stu Peters, both middle MHKs, in to talk to us. Don't forget, if you've got a question for the MHKs, uh, please call 661368. Uh, you can also text 166177 and there are quite a few texts I need to get to uh, or email studio at manxradio.com um, Before we take uh, the next caller which is Ned there was a question came in on WhatsApp uh, which is uh, and it came in to this show Can Mrs Farragher answer one question as it's a question to me uh, a concern to me, sorry. Question. You want the bishop removed from Tinwald. Can you reassure me you won't be pushing to have religious education removed from schools? Well, sadly, we don't have a Mrs. Farragher, but perhaps the, the two of you would uh, be prepared to answer that, maybe start yeah, with you, Yeah, could probably phone her <laughs> and find out. <laughs> um, I expect that, that this is one of the things that Jane and I disagree about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I voted for the removal of the bishop uh, or the bishop's vote, certainly, uh, whether or not the bishop should still be uh, in Timwald without a vote, I'm, I'm uh, less sure about. Uh, but I don't believe that religion and politics go together. So so on that basis, uh, and people say, but the bishop represents a, a lot of people. There are all sorts of people in society who represent a lot of people, uh, but we don't necessarily give them a, a seat in Timwald. Jane? So um, actually... Stu, I, like you, also uh, voted in favour of removing the vote, although I do value the voice of, of the bishop in Tinwald. And I actually looked into this um, back when the Lord Lisvane uh, Select Committee was uh, sitting, um, and I spent a bit of time looking into it, actually, and made a submission at the time, and I've spoken in the same way since in debates in Tinwald in 2018 and the debate in Tinwald we had last June. So um, I have valued very much and do value the voice of, of the Bishop in Timwald and in Legislative Council. But I do believe that it is important that um, the vote is about that uh, accountability and the Bishop is appointed to Timwald and actually every other member of Timwald is either elected or in either directly into Keys or indirectly into um, Legislative Council. Well, we'll go now to Ned, who apparently has a question on um, on Isle of Man education and Ofsted, and if I use the right mouse, I can hopefully click. There we go. Ned, uh, you have a question. I do indeed. I may very well be too late. The decisions might already be made, but I would like to ask your two guests if they have an opinion as to whether or not education in the Isle of Man needs Ofsted. There we go. Uh, who wants to start with that? Stu? Uh, 
I, I don't really know, to be honest. I'll, I'll hold my hands up about that. Um, um, whether or not uh, Ofsted would be um, of benefit to us, you know, we, it's the old thing about, you know, in the we're, we're the Isle of Man and we set our own rules and we've got our own systems. Whether or not an external force would be a good thing or not, I, I don't know. In certain circumstances, it is. Whether it would be in education, I, I honestly don't know. Jane? So... Hi, hello, Ned. I, I think uh, the question for me is, in every case, actually, how do we satisfy ourselves around quality assurance? So is Ofsted the right way to do that for the Isle of Man? Um, it is a way. I know the Department of Education are actually working on a new quality assurance framework where they have brought in external um, people to develop that. And I think that's the work they're doing i think if it works for the isle of man and it delivers what we need which is quality assurance as to our schools and our education then i think that's absolutely fine i don't think we necessarily need to bring in ofsted i mean my analogy would be you know we've brought in external inspectorates to look at the constabulary to look at the prison um the health, health services service brought in cqc so we do we do bring in off island inspectorates to advise us and look at our services and advise how we're doing and where we may need to improve um so i'm i'm open to doing that but i think the question is always it, it, it doesn't have to be that. There may be another way. And I think as the Department of Education is working on this new quality assurance framework, I think we see how that goes. So, Ned, having asked the question, are you satisfied with the answers? Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for an answer, Phil. I was more looking for an opinion. I have my own opinion. I consider there to be nothing wrong with education. I'm hearing claims of success in all departments of education every year and I wonder to myself how much more do they want to improve it and to what end um, I think I hear no complaints about the lack of education in the Isle of Man and I wonder why this organisation which undoubtedly has an, a very negative cloud hanging over it, self-induced hanging over it at the moment do we need them that would be my opinion but i was just soliciting an opinion from my mhk's that's all it was well thank you for doing so um the screen on, on my computer is lit up like uh, blackpool illuminations now so uh, next on our list is uh, um, one uh, eddie hudson and uh, he asks what the guest's view on the swimming pool uh, is. I know, uh, Jane, you, you managed to get to the meeting last night uh, of the MHKs yeah. and the commissioners, Stu, you, you were unable to attend. Um, but, uh, yeah, w uh, we'll let's hear from Eddie, hopefully. Let's see, can I find which button to press? Um, no, I'm using the wrong mouse, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Try that one. Eddie, are you there? I, I am indeed, yes. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, um, just wondering, either, uh, either of the, your uh, guests today, did they have any um, anything green in their agendas? Well, uh, uh, Stu, you're you're a known green campaigner. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh right, so so it's not so much about the swimming pool then, or is it? Oh yes, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, when I say green, um, what I'm actually meaning is. Anything to do with the health of people or the kids, yeah. the health of the island is all to do with green, isn't it, surely? OK, all right. Um, yeah, uh, the, the southern swimming pool. I, mm -hmm. what, what, what I tend to do, Eddie, is that I concentrate on the things that I think I might have a, a valid opinion on, and I, I tend to stay away from things that, that I don't know an awful lot about. So education is mm -hmm. one of those areas that I, I tend to stay away from unless somebody uh, asks me to get involved in something. Um, looking at this dispassionately, and I think that to an extent you've got to do that, um, this closure of the southern swimming pool... Um, <laughs> It is not maybe the big problem that people say it is um, because we're a small island. You're never that far from anywhere. And I think that the people who would use the southern swimming pool have only got to go to Peel or Douglas, uh, which is a slightly longer bus trip away than, than the southern pool is. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I trust the Department of Education and their officers to decide what is the best use of their resources. Jane? Yes, so Phil, you're right. Um, I did uh, 
go to the meeting last night, which was a it was a private meeting because it was about uh, MHKs and and Middle obviously Santon is part of Middle, so that's the the connection mm-hmm. with Middle, um, and the pool board and some of the local authority representatives. And I think um, what uh, is important is. Uh, yes, a report has gone into the public domain. Um, I think the Southern Pool Board have published uh, yesterday and, and reiterated last night that their need, their subvention need to continue operating is not as has been uh, understood in the in the report that has been published. So I think when there is a... a, a, a a question raised by the Southern Board, then then the right thing to do is is look at what they are saying, actually. So I think uh, what is uh, positive about the opportunity to come together and talk is it allows an opportunity to, to look again. And I think it is important that when whatever decisions we're making and all the decisions that we're going to be making at the moment are in the context of you know, difficult financial circumstances. There is no two ways about it. You know, the island has to try and live within its means. Um, But even within that, it's important that we do so from a a well-informed and understood basis. And that doesn't... Go uh, Sorry, go on, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, the first part of my question was, did you have any green agenda at all at the beginning when when you were voted in? Oh, well, yes. I mean... um, Eddie, what I I definitely in in the sense of green around uh, climate change and addressing the need to be sustainable sustainable as an island, um, yes, I did. I do believe it's the right thing for the island to transition to net zero. I do believe it's the right thing for us to transition ourselves to uh, renewable sources of energy, particularly in the context of our existing power infrastructure and generation is uh, due to be coming to the end of its life over the next decade or so. So that would necessitate investment in any event in our power generation infrastructure Um, and more broadly about helping us become sustainable as as households in terms of retrofitting and so on. I, I did have that. And I think you said it's also in the context of health and well-being. Yes, um, I supported that we uh, tried the model of Manx Care and in terms of delivering improved health outcomes for the island, I, I do believe that um, del- making our health services work as efficiently and effectively as possible for the well-being of all of us is a really important thing that we must progress. Uh, I think, so if, so if, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Eddie, well, uh, I think to answer the green part of your question, this is one of the, the areas and very few areas where Jane and I disagree. I'm com- I'm all for clean and green, but I'm totally against climate change mitigation. I think that climate change is a, a, a natural uh, thing. I don't think that CO2 has got anything to do with it. And I think that we are facing ruinous costs in introducing things like uh, renewable energy and electric cars. I think it's a complete and utter nonsense. Well, thank you. That's, and that's exactly what I like to hear, uh, people using common sense. One of the things, I, I, when I was on the other day, I mean, you know I'm totally against the uh, onshore wind farms. Um, the, 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 we've figured it out, all of us up here. We've been doing all our figures and everything. That if we do go along the way of these uh, onshore wind farms, this could cost the government uh, about $700 million. Uh, over the next 10 years, that is without any maintenance whatsoever or any anything going wrong. There isn't now, enough money in the universe that? to pay for net zero globally, I don't think. No. And the trouble is well, that I... we talk a lot about energy uh, resilience and independence. fact of the matter is that we are on a, a steady path now to electrifying everything. Uh, so your, your ground source heat pump and all the rest of it is going to rely on ele- electricity. We are transitioning now to uh, things like um, uh, wind turbines and solar panels. So when it snows and when the wind doesn't blow, there's going to be no, no electricity coming out of them. We're going to have so probably right. a new interconnector to the UK. You know, if they've got supply problems in the UK, then we're right at the end of that chain. So we're probably not going to be getting any electric down there. So, you know, we're getting rid of of perfectly usable fossil fuels like gas and oil that are keeping people warm at the moment. And I I can see huge problems in the future when the grid is completely overloaded and and it isn't supplying enough. So I think it's very important, though, to recognise that at the moment the island is about 98% reliant on imported energy. 
Uh, and I actually do think, and we've seen the uh, energy shocks, and I'm afraid the world situation is still incredibly volatile. So I think, you know, the, the gas price hike that we've seen over the last uh, two years that has hit households, but it's also hit uh, government budgets, local authority budgets. So if we want to take it back to the pool, one of the significant costs that has impacted the ability to run our um, facilities on the Isle of Man has been the price of gas. And if we can transition ourselves, and it will take time, it is not an overnight change, but had there been or are there the, the possibility, for example, to locate data centres next to our facilities, to have solar panels. And I can say that, um, for example, in Home Affairs, we've taken the initiative and put solar panels up at the mast at Carnane. It is already generating savings for us on our energy budget in year. So I think it is the right thing to do. I also think it has the potential to save us money on our energy costs. Well, I hate to do this, Eddie, but we, we've, I've, I've got four callers waiting, uh, no, three callers waiting now, so I'll, I'll have to move on. Um, next up is uh, Peter Murcott. Um, Peter, uh, you've got a question for our guests. Oh, thank you. It's Peter Murcott here. Um, I would wholly support what Stuart Peters was saying. I remember with great affection the number of times when we used to talk on radio when he used to take the man in line. And I do agree enormously with a lot of things that Stu says. I'd just like to bring us back to this question of the hate crimes and the legislation that's coming through. I noticed that uh, quite often the word abusive and threatening came up um, when we were talking about the the need for uh, more offences. In actual fact, that is a word, those are words that already exist in the Public Order Act, and I can't quite understand why we're looking for new offences at the moment. And somebody mentioned harassment, which is rather a vague expression, because I would have thought that the first step would be to examine carefully why the existing law is not working and what needs to be done to it with the minimum interference on freedom of expression. Your problem is with this word hate. If you look over at the United Kingdom, it has degenerated very badly into, I just don't happen to like your view. That is extremely dangerous in a democratic society. And too much attention has been given to the perception of the person and not the objective question as to whether a fair-minded person would call this hate, because really, hate is a type of... It's someone bordering on insanity who is uh, expressing hate. And so I'm extremely worried at the way things are going. And one of your major problems in the UK is that the legislation does not define what hate means. And that is an open invitation for the word soon to degenerate into a sort of Stalinist crime, a little bit like in the purges in the 1930s, where it was just enough to say of someone that they were a, an enemy of the people for that to be proved by the Peter, I, I, I'm going to have to rush you there because uh, yep. we've, 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 we're, we, sadly we are going to be running out of time shortly and we've got two callers waiting. Um, a specific question for the, the two guests? Yes. Are you going to uh, define the word hate, first of all, and are you going to have a free speech protection clause in any legislation so that it does not go out of control as has happened in Britain? I think that's a very good question, Peter, and uh, I'm a member of the Free Speech Union uh, in the UK because I value free speech and the ability to say what you think as long as you're not actually harming anybody by it. Trouble is that there is a lot of, of supposed hate speech at the moment, at the moment, which is purely people who take offence at a comment, and there's a big difference between taking offence and hating uh, and inciting trouble, and uh, I think that the legislation's got to be very careful to... Uh, to, to make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think Stu's point is absolutely valid, that what we're talking about is if we're bringing forward legislation that creates any criminal offences or allows for aggravated sentencing powers in respect of certain behaviour, that we do define it carefully. And as I said earlier, importantly, it goes...
goes out to consultation. And the other thing I would say is any legislation that eventually we do pass with its definitions and so on, separately from politicians, we have an independent judiciary, we have an independent police force. And so the mechanisms actually in practice to investigate and then um, take any action are, of course, robust um, open, transparent uh, mechanisms. OK, well, uh, I, I can say to John, what is the purpose of government on line two? Um, we're coming to you as soon as we have these uh, adverts. When the man in line's not on air, call Manx Radio to leave your opinion for broadcast on 682 631. And someone who did that um, was, I I, I haven't got the name, but uh, they say, this is a message for Stu. I took a birthday card to the sorting office today at 3.20pm for delivery tomorrow. I told... Uh, I was told delivery tomorrow couldn't be guaranteed unless I paid about £6. I would like to know what happens between the front and back office that could take more than one day. Can Stu explain? I don't know. <laughs> Hands up, I, I don't know. Uh, with a question like that, and I sometimes do get questions um, as chairman of the post office from people, and uh, I usually refer them to the post office and ask that question myself, you know, because that doesn't make sense to me. You take it to the sorting office at three o'clock on one day and you expect it to be delivered the next. I can't see why uh, it wouldn't happen. OK, um, so Peter, uh, no, not Peter, we just had Peter, didn't we? John, and, and if I use the right mouse, there we go. Um, John. Apologies for, for, for you having to hang on for so long, but we do seem to be busy today. Uh, what is your question to Stu Peters and Jane Poole Wilson? Good afternoon, Stu, Jane, and uh, well, Phil. Yes, of course, yeah. it's not Andy, is it? It's Phil. No, sadly. Um, I'll, I'll keep it very quick and simple because I know you're having single trip ball there and uh, people trying to get on. To all three of you, what is the purpose of government? There isn't a right or wrong answer. I'd just like to know what your thoughts are purpose of government i suppose any society needs people to organize things uh, otherwise it's just complete anarchy so the purpose of government is to try and um, collect and utilize resources for the benefits of the people and i realize i might have walked into a man trap there but that's my take on it yeah i think i think that's right isn't it i mean government is there to try and marshal you know we we talk about public money it's taxpayers money it's all our money um, but actually in the interests of uh, society to protect it, to look after it, to promote its best interests. And, and you asked all three of us, so I'm going to very briefly yes. say, um, I, I, I'll, I'll use the government as in the politicians. Uh, the purpose of the politicians is to uh, interfere and meddle with the system when it is not delivering for the people. Um, obviously the civil service can continue operating the laws and legislation and policies that exist uh, until the cows come home Um, but obviously there comes times when that no longer is fit for purpose for example when we moved from horses and carts to motor cars there needed to be a change and that's what politicians are there for so uh, yeah um, hopefully that answers John's question Um, moving on then we have um, Brian, I think, um, on line four. And Brian has some planning issues, I think. Hello. Hello, Brian. Hello. Oh, hello, hello, guys. Hello, everyone. Um, my question is for the members. Um, should political members have an opinion on local planning decisions, applications? I think that, uh, that politicians are often asked to have a look at uh, an issue on behalf of a constituent, and I think that that's part of the constitutional work that we do. Um, uh, Whether or not politicians should have uh, any more sway than that, uh, I would say probably not. I think it's a good good question, Brian. I think uh, the, the issue is, if you like, from a politician's perspective, and we are specifically guided about this, actually, in the government and um, in the government code, which and, and sort of Tim Wald's advice as well is, it, where a planning matter might be between two constituents, um, it's probably not that helpful for a politician to try and intervene or indeed take sides or advise on one or the other. I think where uh, you also wear a, a 
a particular hat. So in my case, if I'm wearing the hat of Minister of Home Affairs and a particular planning application has to have a view from, say, the Fire and Rescue Service, then I would have to be mindful that the department would take a professional view on that, if you like. So I think it always depends on the on the context. Um, but one thing I do think is very important, because I think if people are engaging in a process, whether it's planning or another process, if it's the first time somebody's come to that sort of process and they don't they don't know how best to navigate it I think politicians absolutely have a a possibility to help support constituents and other people understand the system and navigate it and I think I think to Phil's point actually certainly when people have contacted me to raise questions and issues there's an opportunity to actually say well does the system need to be improved as opposed to on this particular application if that makes sense Okay. You happy with that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, well, sort of. So I'd like to go back to Stu. So it, it, where I live, there's a agricultural land next to me, and there's a planning application got in for a large house and barn, which um, Stu Peters has wrote in with his opinion yep. on the matter. Uh, I would like to record that I am absolutely in support of this development, as I believe it will have no impact on the neighbours. Yeah. So that's the bit I take umbrage with, as I am a neighbour, and so are the other 20 neighbours, and your shadow has not graced my door. So how can you say that will not impact my me? Uh, how can you have an opinion without asking me first? How, how will it or impact the, the relevant you? relevant neighbours. How, 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 how will this impact you? Well, firstly, it's on agricultural land. It'll affect our views. Our neighbours, it's in, right in front of them. There's never been a house or any sort of dwelling there at all. But surely, and we've all got our own personal opinions, but surely your job as a politician, if you're going to put your name on the block and support an issue, yeah. you should go and speak to the other constituents before you have an opinion. Uh, or, I don't know. If, if, if you came to me and, and said that you were putting a planning application in, you explained it to me and I agreed with you that it seemed like a, a good scheme, uh, you asked me to, to send a letter of recommendation, then I would do that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, go and knock on every door in the affected area. Uh, and I appreciate that, that me giving support to this particular scheme uh, caused some dismay amongst neighbours, uh, but it is what it is. Well, thanks for that, Brian. Uh, sadly, we are approaching the end of the, the programme. All the searching, penetrative uh, questions that I had for our two guests will have to wait for another time. What a um, shame. <laughs> the 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 question, though, I, th- I suppose about the Southern Pool, which many people are maybe struggling to understand, is how can you have um, a, a report which apparently doesn't represent what was fed into it by the, the Southern Pool Board? Certainly that's the, 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 the uh, press release that the Pool Board has put out. It seems very strange. Two different sides. I mean, there are always two sides to an argument, aren't there? Yeah, but you would have thought with statistics that would have been straightforward. I think, um, as I said earlier, Phil, if uh, given what the Southern Board has put out, I think it's the right thing to always have a, have a look and try and understand uh, what the Southern Pool Board is say, you know, is is saying is their required subvention to operate for another year. So I think that's having heard that, I think it's important to look at it. Well, I hate to say it, but we've reached the end of our allotted hour. Um, I would like to thank um, Jane Poole Wilson, Deputy Chief Minister, Home Affairs Minister, uh, and um, Stu Peters, Chair of the Isle of Man Post, uh, amongst other things. Oh, you're a uh, member of the member. highways uh, in, in DOI. Yeah, uh, um, well, that's my fault. Yeah, and, and also to thank uh, particularly you, the listeners, for listening and indeed for uh, playing an active part in the programme. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, I hope that my uh, ability to operate the knobs and dials will improve as time goes on. Um, but uh, all that remains for me to say is um, up next, it's Nenji's Tree with Christy D and... Um, that's it, that's all.